when I was younger, so when I studied, I studied and I moved across from West into Cheddar to study because my parents thought Cheddar was a good schooling system. Uh, so they moved region so that I could get in. The problem was I wasn't a great student. By, by just whatever kind of thing, whatever was presented to me, I wasn't a great student. I wasn't naughty. I couldn't be naughty. My parents went to the church. Uh, my science teacher was my Sunday school teacher. Um, so I was in one of those situations like naughtiness wasn't an option at school. The problem I had was that I struggled academically. I struggled at the very <coughs> core of what education was. So I'd often see on my reports, my parents would hear at parents' evening that Tim is an incredibly social student and loves group participation. Swiftly followed by things like, Tim could achieve a lot more if he stopped talking. <laughs> and it's interesting, isn't it, how they spent all this time trying to curb out of me. The thing that they tried to quash in me was my love of people and community and talking to people, which now stood here, I would love the opportunity to have known back then and just say to them, you are aware this is probably what I'll end up doing more, so you could teach me better in this. <laughs> But they drummed into me this idea that what I wrote, what I produced for them, was, was how they gauged whether I was good, whether I was achieving, whether they needed to ring my parents, how my report cards looked, was all based on this. I was often told I was lazy. I didn't match up to the other students, but many of my head teachers' <coughs> comments would end with, I had top group potential. Which, when you say that to someone's parents, just puts you in a really bad position. My parents just constantly assumed I could achieve that. I loved school. I had no problems with it. would often try and avoid being ill so I could be there, largely because for 15 minutes in the morning and for an hour during lunchtime, I got to do the thing I loved, which was be with my friends, play football, just enjoy being around people. But I had no problem with school. I got through. I finished with eight GCSEs, A to C, a couple of Ds. I managed a U in German. Uh, which is unbelievable because my tutor was German and she was devastated. <laughs> but the problem was I didn't do it right. Even with those grades, it didn't quite work for them. It didn't look how they felt it should. And on the whole, the reason being, I talked too much and I was lazy. That was their conclusion. If you play this forward by 10 years, I'm sat in my opening week at Bible college and they sit us down as a group, every new student, and we fill out a 20-question questionnaire. And if you got enough questions right, which blindsiding us were technically wrong, then you then had an opportunity to sit a small paper. I successfully got enough questions wrong and sat this paper. That was followed then by three separate meetings with a specialist and eventually a two hour um, assess assessment of me in Bath, all to conclude that my capacity to be dyslexic was off the chart. By this point, I was, in, I was about 26, before anyone realized that I struggled with dyslexia. So I'd grown up being told I was lazy. I was growing up being told that I couldn't achieve what I needed to because I just didn't put the effort in. The problem now was at 26, I learned so many tricks to avoid writing things that they actually had to process me to work out I was dyslexic. I was notoriously bad at overwriting on word counts because I knew what the word I wanted to say was, but I didn't know how to spell it. So I'd write an entire sentence to explain the word that I wanted to use. I would avoid writing on the board with any way that I could find possible. I would learn long words to use in conversation so people didn't think I was silly. I had no idea why I was doing it. It was just mechanisms I was learning. But yet all of this didn't really add up because I could sit down and make conversations with a stranger. In fairness, in my 30s, I learned which part of the day was AM and PM. One of those things I struggle with. I still couldn't tell you which there, there, or there needs to go into a sentence. Just things I've never been able to get a grasp of, and that's okay. Because I struggled at school because I wasn't stereotypical. I wasn't how I should have looked. They wanted me to present in one way and I couldn't. I was told time and time again I was lazy when really I was pouring myself into that work. I just couldn't get it to look like they wanted to. And it's not fair. It wasn't fair on me, it's not fair on hordes of children that struggle in the same way. But I do understand teachers need a way to gauge from A to B how a student's doing. They need to be able to record our abilities by a standard that they set. It's a process that I think is wrong, but I understand it. 
The problem I have and the problem we have is in church, it's just plain wrong. In schools, I forgive them because they have to show progression. They have to be able to monitor how a child's doing. But in church, we don't need to do it. But we do. We look at people and we think, they don't do things the way we think they should. Or they don't do the things we think they should. Or we look at people and say, they do do things we don't think they should. The way they do it, I'm not sure I like. And we end up marking them down. Somehow we get caught up in grading people like teachers do, like test papers do. As Mel read, we read this from Ephesians. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Every single one of us was about to get an F on our test paper. Every single one of us was deserving of failure. It's what Paul's saying. Every single one of us was in the same place, ready to be given failure. I said it this morning, say it again, I love the fact that Paul starts all of this with that level playing field. Paul wants to make sure every single person is on the same page. We all start from the same place. All of us are in the same spot, in the same boat. And it's important for us to get a handle on because age or title, size of giving, time spent serving, all of them, they don't equate to salvation. None of them stop our starting point being what it was. None of them change the beginning. We were deserving of wrath. So for those of us who are saved, for those of us that would say that something has changed, what was that point? What was the moment? And Paul puts it like this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. I love this bit. I tell you all the time I love stuff, but I genuinely love this bit. Because the message of hope and salvation, the message of hope and salvation that the world needs and we need to hear again and again and again and take claim of starts like this. But because, but because, it's an in spite of comment. But because says (coughs) this, but because of something else, we can move past this. But because says, I see you and I see what you've done, but... It's an amazing place to start. We were dead in our sins, deserving of wrath, but. As Christians, that but is the most important moment. Because the thing that follows that but is the thing that brought us salvation. That but does just enough to stop everything that's going on, to gain our attention, to see that God made us alive in Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace, grace alone, that we've been saved. Please hear me. I do I have no problem with people. <clears throat> I think you guys are amazing. People play music, the welcome team, the teas and coffees, those that serve in the week. We have a toddler's group, we have a preschool, people go and do pastoral visits, years of faithfulness to this church, tithing, so many amazing things. I am so grateful for them. Honestly, the way this church was was a huge reason that me and Laura and Evie ended up here. So they are amazing and hear that and know that. But the truth is none of it is saving you. None of your service is saving you. It doesn't matter how much you give to this church. It doesn't matter how many hours you spend in here. It doesn't matter if you play the piano or sand the doors. It's not saving you. It's important. It's not saving you. And it's not changing how much God loves you. It's important, but it's not changing how much God loves you. Because the thing that saved us was the grace of God, sending Jesus to die on that cross for our sins. That but stops us long enough to get our attention to look at the cross (coughs) and realize everything changes there. Everything changes at the cross. Everything begins afresh at the cross. All of those other things are important, but none of them are saving us, just the blood of Jesus. (coughs) saves us. It's just the blood. So Paul comes to this conclusion. 
In verse 8, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. Saved by grace equates to no bragging points. Saved by grace means no <coughs> one's getting a higher grade on their test paper. No one can stand there and say, oh, you did well, that's a good 75%, that's a good pass, I got 90 but the Saved by grace takes that away from us. Saved by grace means that no one of us sits above any other. So tied to all those things I listed off, none of it allows us to put a hierarchy in place. Because we're saved by grace. It makes the playing field level, it takes away the capacity to boast. So it means that me as your pastor, I can't boast in my job title. I'm saved by grace. 50 years of salvation for the oldest in this place doesn't allow you to boast. Because you're saved by grace. Those who give the biggest tithe, 80% of their income, you can't boast about that. Because you're saved by grace. Praying the prayer yesterday doesn't allow us to boast. And that's a beautiful thing, and I don't say it to dismiss anything that people do, or any of the incredible achievements people have. I say it to focus us on that realization that we are saved by grace. A gift freely given by God. And that gift was his son's death on the cross. <clears throat> freely given. Jesus died to allow us into relationship with the Father. A price we could never pay. And Paul highlights this. This idea that we all start on a level playing field. And we all were given the same gift. And no matter what we do, we can't enhance the gift. And no matter what we do, we can't knock the gift. It's freely given by a loving Father. So I hope that we can all agree on this, that my teachers got it wrong in school. They judged me based on what they expected me to be able to produce. They judged me on whether I was achieving the standards that they set externally. They thought who I was added to the knowledge that they would impart in lessons, would equal well-written assignments, which I wasn't physically capable of doing. I'm not saying that they were bad people, just the execution of the understanding was wrong. So if we can agree with that, I think we all need to agree at times that we get it wrong too. Either that or you're a much better person than but I've thought those thoughts, I've placed external expectations on people, ways of viewing them. I notice how often people aren't here. I'm well aware that my child is one of them, but those parents that can't keep their children quiet in church, those people that have never served in a ministry, those people I hear socialize in pubs. Sometimes I'm not sure if you're singing in worship, and I even know some of us will pray with our eyes open. I do it. I seem to have decided that there are standards by which I should view people. And yet the more time I spend looking at the gospel, and the more time I spend listening to what Paul says, the more I realise that those are me placing external expectations on an internal journey. They're me placing my standards of living on other people. And I read in Paul, I'm sorry, in this Ephesians letter, that actually... It's not how it works. It works that we all started in the same place. And we were all given the same gift. That means I'm no better than anyone else. It means that none of us are better than anyone else. Because what it means is each of us has received an unbelievable gift. An unbelievable privilege. To be saved by grace. We get so caught up in so many other things that we can lose focus on the cross. So caught up in standards, expectations, service, all these other things that we lose focus on what it was that actually saved us. The cross of Christ. So faith, as Paul says, that moment that we chose to accept the gift of God is faith. 
That moment we stepped out is one of the most beautiful things we have because it's both incredibly personal and yet incredibly communal. It's incredibly personal because we accept, as when we read the Psalms, that this huge God, this God of creation, came down and died on a cross in Jesus for us as individuals. Would have died for any one of us, individually. A hugely personal faith, a very intimate faith, but yet an incredibly communal faith because we see the faith in Christ come alive through the church, through community, through being with one another, it sharpens us. We read in other passages, iron sharpens iron. At no stage are we meant to be lone wolves in this journey. So this creates a beautiful tension. It creates an amazing tension because the truth is God is as active in my life as he is in yours. Ever present, ever loving. And I may well be as committed as you are, but my gifts the demands on my life, the struggles that I face, will differ from yours. And that means the outworking of my faith looks different. And that's okay. That's okay. Because we both love Jesus. We're all saved by grace. And we live differently. And it looks different. So if we all started, and those of you here this morning know where I'm going with this, but if we all started in the same place, and we all received the same gift, we all have the same amazing opportunity, and none of us can boast in it because it's all God's doing. Do we simply conclude that we stop there? Do we conclude that we're okay? As long as we're not judging people, as long as we're not boasting, we're saved. Paul closes with this For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. <coughs> So we know that we're not working for our salvation. We've established this as a foundation. And please hear me. Your salvation is not based in what you do. Your salvation started at the cross before any of us began. But what we do see is that we are built for good works. We're built for good works. The gift is freely received. It should inspire us to be Christ-like. This gift that we receive, this knowledge that we have of our salvation, this relationship that we form with God should be moulding us into a Christ-like image. As we head towards a close, I'm going to touch on that second passage Mel read in James. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. I'm not positive, I think, our salvation is for us. I'm not positive that our salvation was brought about for us. And the reason I say that is because I don't believe salvation is the final destination. I don't think salvation is the arrival point. I think salvation is the ticket office before we go out on the next great adventure. I think salvation is the starting point. Because salvation says, you know what, this is amazing. I accept what God has done for me, and now I want to tell others. Now I want my life to look like Christ. So salvation, whilst amazing, and please don't think I'm belittling it by what I'm saying, I just don't think it's the conclusion. I think it's the prequel to everything that God has, everything that God wants to do. James hits the nail on the head. What good is it? What an amazing life. What good is it to say, you know what? I'm going to be a great person. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to say kind words about you. But I'm going to do nothing. Practically, I'm going to do nothing. James challenges us, what good is it? <clears throat> we say often, frequently, and genuinely, we want to see risk changed. We want to see the lives of those in our families changed. We want to see Jesus break through. 
What do we do about it? What do we practically do about it? How do we engage with it? What good is our salvation if it simply allows us to feel comfortable and safe? Because James challenges us very directly. I want my salvation to be the kind that clothes those without clothes. I want my salvation to be the kind of salvation that sees the need of the hungry and feeds them. Because that's the salvation that I read of, and it's the Jesus that I see. Because I need it to get into heaven. Salvation's assured. Salvation's assured. The reason I do it is because I want the image of Christ laid out in my very DNA when he formed me to be visible. So that people see Christ through my actions. I want to use the gifts that teachers told me were distracting me from achieving the work that I needed to, to let people hear about God. I want to guide the lost. I want to speak love and truth over the broken. So the challenge to you is what is it that Christ built into your very DNA? What is it that Christ built into your very DNA that you can do uniquely? Because I can't judge it. Because not everyone is gifted on piano and not everyone's gifted to speak and not everyone is qualified enough to work for the police or to teach or work in the medical profession. But individuals are. So what is it that God's uniquely built you to do? Where is it that he's uniquely designed you to serve? Because Paul's right and James is right and they don't conflict. This isn't a crisis of faith moment. We can't judge each other's salvation or spirituality by our actions. But we are called to be active. We can't judge action as the barometer of salvation, but we are still called to be active. Please hear that. Please know that. Please know you have a huge part still to play. As a church, we need to accept it looks different. A society that expects it to look different. So many things we could use. So many ways we could judge it. Let's stop. Let's be a people that lift each other up. Let's be a people that encourage each other in their uniqueness. Let's be a people that ask how things are going and pray for one another and push each other to be the best version of themselves, not to fit into some formula. Because that's the uniqueness that God crafted in you at the beginning of your life. I want to close with this. Upstairs, we've got just over 10 young people hearing about God. An incredible work that Catherine and George are doing this evening. Unbelievable the time and effort that's spent in preparing a message that will help them to engage with learning about God. The thing is, the minute they start walking down those stairs, they're looking to you to understand what that looks like. They're looking to you, senior members of the church, What does it look like? What do all the things we're hearing about look like in action? They're looking to you. What can you pass on to them? What can you pass on to them? And the reason I say that is this. You are the best version of the gospel we have. You individually, each of you, are the very best version of the gospel we have. Because through you, we see lived out the truth of Jesus. Through you, we see lived out the heart for the lost, a heart for mission, a heart for the broken. You are the best version of the gospel we have. So many people in your lives will never open the Bible. A whole host of people in your lives won't open the Bible until post something you've said or done. So the responsibility lies with us to be the gospel to them.